The fourth question we will address is, who is likely to make a large charitable estate gift at the end of life? Now, the difference in this question is we're asking about the amount of the charitable estate gift rather than just who is likely to leave something versus who is likely to leave nothing. Now we're looking at predicting the actual amount of the charitable estate gift. Uh, ultimately, uh, this is an important question for fundraising uh, because if the goal is to get uh, resources to a charitable cause, uh, then it's not necessarily that helpful if we're able to convince uh, 50 people uh, to leave $1,000 a piece uh, in their will documents uh, as compared to uh, convincing one person uh, to leave $5 million uh, in an estate document. And so consequently, we actually do care about uh, the actual dollars or financial transfers of charitable estate gifts at death. Now, there's a problem with this, and, and the problem with this is really a matter of statistical methodology. And that is, if we're asking the question of who leaves, uh, who actually transfers dollars to charity at death as a yes or no question, uh, we can feel fairly confident in those responses because we get uh, lots and lots of observations and each person is treated the same. Now, if we're asking the question of predicting the dollars of charitable estate gifts left at death, that becomes more problematic because uh, estate gifts are naturally highly skewed. And by that, I mean there are some enormously large charitable estate gifts, uh, and then there's a lot of uh, relatively small charitable estate gifts. Now, this is true within individual organizations, uh, but it's also true within uh, the country as a whole, and it's true for other countries as well. Uh, every time I've ever worked with uh, even a national uh, data set uh, on charitable estate planning uh, or actual charitable bequest transfers, you see this dramatic reality that it is so highly skewed uh, because there are these substantial, dramatic, uh, large uh, charitable estate transfers that change everything. So, for example, uh, in one year, you might have a Joan Croc who dies, uh, transfers a massive amount of money uh, to charities, and then in the next year, you don't have that happen, right? Th those are things that you can't use, for example, market indicators to predict. You can't, um, uh, you, you can't get a good handle on what it's going to be precisely next year uh, versus this year because the data is inherently lumpy. Uh, that is, it comes in this highly skewed fashion. Uh, and so because of that, when we start to do analysis, um, to, be, to make it very simple, a couple of billionaires can really throw off your averages, right? <laughs> so the, the problem is that when, when we start to predict actual dollars and we have a bunch of people leaving maybe um, you know, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, but then we get just a couple that are leaving $100 million. When we are using our typical statistical techniques uh, for actually predicting dollar amounts, uh, those one or two individuals are going to dramatically influence the results that we get. And so because of that, our results are not quite as stable when it comes to predicting the actual dollars. Again, there's different ways we can try to manage that. We can use different techniques. In some cases, uh, we would use results where we just say, okay, the maximum we're going to count is a $1 million gift. Anything beyond $1 million, we're not going to count it because we've got a $50 million or $100 million gift. And if we, if we count it that way, it's just going to swamp everybody else. Uh, and we're essentially just going to see that the characteristics of that $100 million donor um, instead of typical characteristics. So there's lots of ways to deal with that. But just to be aware uh, before we get into this that these dollar-based analyses 
uh, are dominated by a few major donors. This is much more the case in bequest dollars than it is for current giving, even though it is very much the case for current giving. Uh, And so consequently, these results are a bit less reliable than the simple yes versus no question. Uh, so you can kind of uh, take those uh, with a bit of a grain of salt, um, but I think mo- most of these are fairly uh, uh, expected. And I will say that these results are generally the same regardless of which kind of technique you want to apply to it, whether you want to, for example, uh, cap the maximum gift at a million dollars or uh, use a, a log scale or do various other things, uh, you're going to get essentially these, uh, these same uh, results. So let's look at the top 10 predictors. Uh, and uh, again, uh, average annual giving, how much they're giving on an annual basis. If they're giving a lot every year, that's predicting a charitable, uh, a big charitable bequest. How much money do they end with? And then here we have, once again, childlessness shows up. Uh, The final reported giving, not just what was their annual giving on average uh, during the time they were in the survey, but also how much were they giving at the end. Once again, here we get consistency of reporting a funded trust shows up in the actual dollars transferred. That should be no surprise at this point. We have the highest ever reported wealth. Now, notice this has a minus in front of it. We'll dive into this a bit more in a moment. But why might this have uh, a minus in front of it? Uh, Well, it's because we've already got in the model how much wealth they ended with. Okay, And so this now becomes a negative factor. Um, Why might that be? Well, Well, let me give you an example. Let's suppose a person's ending wealth was, let's say, $10 million. Okay. They're likely the amount that they're actually going to leave to charity out of that ten million dollars is going to go down if a few a few years earlier they reported having wealth of a hundred million dollars. The reason that this is uh, negative is because once we know how much money they ended with, if this is very high, uh, then we actually get this negative trajectory. And when we get a negative trajectory, people give a smaller share of their ending wealth. So so that's why this is actually a negative factor. It wouldn't be a negative factor if the model just had this number in it. But because the model already has this number in it, by the time we're adding this sixth factor, this now becomes a negative because of this one. Uh, Average uh, wealth over time, uh, this is uh, this is also a, a, a positive factor. So we, uh, um, it, it's more this idea that we want to have, uh, a, uh, have uh, positive trajectories. Uh, wealth is good. We just don't want it to be declining wealth. The same explanation applies here where the lowest ever reported wealth is a negative factor, meaning that we don't want this number to be super high because what do we want? What we want is a positive trajectory leading up to the ending wealth at the end of death. So the lower this number is, the better. And since we want a lower number here, that means this is a negative coefficient. So uh, higher numbers pull down the dollars that we expect to, uh, uh, to uh, um, be transferred in a charitable bequest gift. So, so all of these factors They all actually relate to, number one, ending wealth, and uh, then these two relate to the trajectory of the wealth taking place. Uh, So so it's great if we have a positive trajectory. um, We could have uh, uh, consistently high wealth over time. We just don't want that negative uh, trajectory. Uh, The ninth factor is the highest dollars given in any one year. Now, This may create a bit of a question, like, why is this negative? Again, if this was the only factor we were looking at, then we would say this would be positive. We want somebody to have given a big gift uh, uh, at some point. But uh, let's go back and see what we've already included in the model. And this is the important factor. We've already included average annual giving. So if somebody has, let's say, an average annual giving of a million dollars a year if uh, and let's say they reported that in 10 different years 
would we rather have somebody who reported a million dollars a year every year? Or would we rather have somebody who reported one $10 million gift and then never gave in the other nine years? Well, the answer is we would actually rather have somebody who reported a million dollars a year every year consistently. And so that's why this is actually, once we know what their average annual giving was, it was this is actually a negative factor uh, that we don't want that. We would prefer that giving to have been consistent giving year after year after year rather than, oh, well, they had a high average just because they did a one, one-time one massive transfer and then they never donated before or after. That's why this is actually a negative factor once we put this in. Again, if we only had this variable by itself, this would be a positive factor, but because we have this in, um, we know how much they gave on average. We also know how much they were giving at the end. Um, so since we already know those two factors, uh, this, if it's super high, indicates that they actually weren't a consistent giver at this high level. They just had this uh, unusual one-time gift. Um, so we want a high average. We want a high average giving, uh, but a low highest giving. That means it was high, uh, but it was consistent. And then the final factor, uh, again, no surprise here, if somebody's unmarried, that predicts they're going to leave more dollars uh, because it uh, it's, uh, increases the probability that they're actually going to leave something to, uh, to charity. So let's dive into the numbers a little bit more. Uh, as before, there is an underlying model uh, that we're using here. Uh, this is, once again, a stepwise regression. Uh, what that means is that we throw in about 60 different variables into the model. Um, this is pure, what we might call data mining, uh, roughly theory-free, other than um, trying to throw in everything, including the kitchen sink, uh, to, uh, th uh, to use those uh, 60 different models. Uh, and it just says, okay, throw everything in. What is the best model predicting the highest amount of variation? Um, that is, uh, predicting the highest, uh, highest amount of variation in the dollars that are given. So here we are only predicting the dollar amount that is given. And of course, for most people, that dollar amount is going to be zero. Uh, and so that's, uh, th this is uh, just... Um, this is not limited to people who are donors. This is all people predicting, on average, how much are they going to give. Uh, now, again, these are averages. Those averages mean uh, with 10 people in a group, nine of them are going to give zero. Uh, one of them is going to give $10,000, and you're going to get a $1,000 average. So, so understand this is not limited to people that actually transfer dollars to charity at death. Uh, this is actually looking at uh, the uh, population as a whole, and also recognizing that uh, the uh, that uh, uh, more than ninety percent of people will leave zero dollars to charity at death. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, some of the factors. Uh, if we only had one factor and we were trying to predict on average how much is this group going to leave to charity, uh, then uh, the most important factor is. What was their average giving during life? Uh, so this is uh, measured by thousands of dollars uh, in average giving uh, during life. And, and by during life, I mean during the period of time that people were in this study uh, and uh, before they died. Uh, so the, the study is of adults age 50 and above. Uh, that does not mean, however, that everyone has been in the study since they were 50, uh, because the study originally started back in 1992 uh, with a uh, uh, relatively uh, younger age group, uh, and then in 1993 there was another precursor study uh, called the AHEAD survey, which only looked at people age 70 and above. So, for example, somebody may have come in uh, as part of the AHEAD study, they may have been uh, 70 uh, or 80 uh, or even 90 uh, and then died. And so consequently, the average giving is just the average giving while they were in the study. That might The study's been going on for about 25 years. So, <clears throat> so that average giving may have been over their last uh, 20 years of life, 15 years of life, 10 years of life. Um, it just depends on uh, the time between when they entered the study and, and when they died. 
So this average giving uh, while they were in the study, average current giving, uh, predicts how much they're going to leave at death. So uh, very simply put, if uh, a person was giving $1,000 a year on average during life, uh, on average, uh, a group of those people are going to leave uh, $1,400 uh, more in an estate gift than somebody who gave $0 during life. Okay, and, and this scales up. So again, we start with our base rate. Uh, so just uh, people that we know nothing about, uh, people who are not uh, making any particular donations during life, on average, are going to leave fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, and uh, if uh, if we switch to somebody who is giving a thousand dollars a year during life, on average, uh, they're going to leave uh, two thousand nine hundred and fourteen dollars because we add both of these factors together. Now, keep in mind when we say that this is predicting how much they're going to give. Recognize that for ninety five percent of people, what they're going to give is zero, right? Uh, so what this is a better way to think of this is not if uh, somebody is giving a thousand dollars on average that they're going to leave three thousand dollars approximately to charity, uh, a little less than that. Uh, instead, it's better to say it's better to think of it as uh, if we had a hundred people giving a thousand dollars to charity, on average. Uh, those 100 people are going to leave uh, $3,000 uh, to charity. And the way that's going to be done is nine, uh, 90 people are going to leave, or 90, uh, say uh, 90 people are going to leave zero, and 10 people are going to leave $30,000 a piece. Right. So understand that the typical behavior here, the the uh, uh, behavior of uh, more than nine out of ten folks, is to leave nothing. Uh, but if we average in all of those zeros, uh, then we would say among a group, uh, the group average uh, for somebody giving a thousand dollars is going to be three thousand uh, dollars that they're going to leave. Now, if a person on average is giving ten thousand dollars a year to charity, this suggests that. Uh, we would predict on average that they're going to leave $14,150 plus this $1,500 uh, uh, to charity. Uh, so um, uh, we add those numbers up. Again, if they're leaving 100, if they're giving $100,000 a year on average to charity, uh, then we would expect they're going to leave this uh, $1,500 uh, plus. Um, the $141,000 to charity. So this scales up with the uh, thousands of dollars uh, on average that, that they're giving. So basically what this is telling us is that giving adds on about a 1.4 factor. Uh, whatever they were giving during life, we expect about 1.4 um, uh, times that that will be transferred uh, at death on top of this $1,500 base rate. Okay. Uh, the next factor that is uh, of, uh, of interest to us uh, is, of course, uh, no surprise here, it's going to be how much wealth they died with, right? Now that we're not predicting yes-no behavior, now that we're predicting dollars, uh, all of a sudden wealth becomes super important. In fact, it's the uh, second most important factor uh, that we've got here um, uh, right after how much on average were they giving. Uh, because fundamentally, it doesn't matter how charitable somebody is. It doesn't matter how generous they are. It doesn't matter how much they love your cause. Um, if they die uh, with no wealth, uh, they're not going to transfer any dollars to your organization. Um, somebody might like your cause just a little bit. They die with $10 billion and only leave you half of 1%. You know, that's a, that's a pretty big gift. So this is where wealth really kicks in. It really becomes important. And so essentially what we get here is wealth predicts for every $1,000 extra of wealth, uh, we're going to predict another $4 of, uh, of charitable estate transfers. As we add in other variables, you can see that varies uh, from 4 3 5 4 5 but it's around $4. Uh, so if somebody uh, dies with uh, $10,000 of wealth, that predicts an extra uh, $40 of giving. If they die with $100,000 of wealth, that 
predicts an extra four hundred dollars of giving, and and of course all, all the way up uh, is how that uh, how that works. Um, now, because people are dying with a fair amount of wealth, you notice that this base rate for this calculation has gone down. Uh, the base rate goes down because now we're adding in wealth, and if we were looking at a person who died with a million dollars of wealth, uh, that's going to add on uh, $4,000 of uh, predicted average uh, gifts to charity at death. Uh, and so, uh, so that's why this base rate's going down, because this number can be very high as well. So the next factor we look at is uh, the uh, uh, absence of, uh, of children, no offspring. Uh, that's important everywhere. How important is it? Uh, it's worth ten grand. Right. Uh, e even if you already know how much they're giving every year, and you know how much uh, wealth they're going to die with, this was their last reported wealth. Um, uh, so this was in their last survey prior to death. How much wealth they reported? Um, the uh, fact that they have no offspring that by itself uh, counts for around ten thousand uh, dollars, and uh, in terms of the predicted uh, dollar transfer. Uh, now again, that factor doesn't really vary that much as we add in all of these other information about them. Uh, it's still about a 10 grand factor, um, and uh, this is using $2012 for this one, I think, um, either 2012 or 2014. Uh, and again, this we're running this uh, against the uh, um, the uh, health and retirement study when we had over twelve thousand people who had died, uh, and so uh, so we've got a, a pretty healthy number of uh, of observations here. Uh, so so that's what the uh, uh, no uh, offspring um, uh, means. Uh, now, once again, we saw this before in the last model. Our base rate is now negative. Um, uh, these are trying to predict dollars. Obviously, somebody can't leave negative dollars to uh, a charity. So if you had somebody who had grandchildren um, and uh, died with only, say, $1,000 and never donated, this would predict they're going to give negative to $138. Uh, that obviously can't happen, but uh, you get the idea. This, this is trying to uh, make a prediction, and sometimes you get these weird negative numbers, but for most people, um, they're not, you know, they're going to die with some wealth. Maybe they gave something, uh, and so this, the ultimate predictive number is not going to be, uh, is not going to be negative. So the next factor is the uh, dollars of giving in the last report. Uh, so that means uh, we want them to have been good donors during life, and it's a good sign if they were still giving right up to the point of death. Uh, so, so that's positive as well. Uh, so now we take the uh, average, and you notice back here the average was worth about 1.4 times uh, the average giving. Uh, now it's worth about one time uh, the average giving, uh, and that stays consistent through here and then goes back up again with some of the later models. Uh, but we add on uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, giving in the last report uh, bumps it up a little bit. Uh, so however, uh, if they were giving $1,000 during life, during the last report, we're going to add on another $341 of predicted um, giving uh, in, their, uh, in their charitable uh, estate gift. Uh, so these things are additive. Uh, if you have somebody who averaged $1,000 a year giving during life, uh, then you say, okay, we're going to bump up their prediction by uh, $1,000. Uh, and if they also uh, made that gift in the last survey prior to their death, uh, we're going to add on this $336. Uh, and again, this scales. This could be 10000 uh, This could be 20000 And this number just keeps going up. Uh, basically, um, we just uh, multiply it by either 1 uh, or by uh, 0.3 uh, here. The next factor, uh, which we talked about in the last uh, segment of the, the uh, lectures, uh, was the importance of reporting a funded trust. Uh, this is the consistency the, the, in reporting having a funded trust. Uh, and we find that if somebody's uh, reported, if, they've, if they're always reporting having a funded trust, um, this is important because they've had it for a lot of years, they weren't mistaken about the question, were very confident they had a trust, uh, that's worth about 10 grand. 
uh, depending upon the model, bounces between 10 to 11 grand, but, but about $10,000. Uh, so you notice uh, having a funded trust uh, is actually just as valuable in dollars uh, as uh, n having uh, no offspring. So if you're sort of frustrated, you look at all this statistical research and it says, hey, childlessness is, is everything. And it is, in fact, the most important factor. But you can't change that, right? You, you've got your group of donors, you, you, and only a small percentage of them are going to be childless. Uh, but guess what? You can change this, uh, or you can at least influence uh, having that funded trust, and it's worth um, actually just a bit more than childlessness in terms of the uh, uh, dollars predicted. And as we looked at in the previous lecture, uh, this is not just because of the kind of people who have trusts. Uh, it is, in fact, uh, an effect of the document. Uh, so uh, here as well, uh, this is not because that people who have trusts are, uh, for example, uh, wealthier people. The reason that we know that is because once we put this variable in, and we're putting it in here, we already know how much wealth they died with, right? The effect of this is not just because people with a trust are more charitable, because we already know how much they were giving. And we, in fact, know how much they were giving um, in their last survey prior to death. Uh, so this is, uh, this is an effect of the document itself. Uh, as we saw more precisely in some previous research, uh, it's worth, on average, uh, 10 grand uh, per person uh, in terms of their actual predicted transfers to charity to have them uh, consistently reporting that they have a funded trust. So it's a so it's a pretty big deal if you actually want to get dollars transferred to charity. Uh, wills typically don't work. Only 38 percent. Uh, of the cases, does a will actually control anything? Uh, whereas with the funded trusts, uh, funded trust, uh, those do uh, actually control the wealth. Okay, so some other factors that uh, we see here, uh, these have to do with uh, wealth trajectory. So we see the highest reported wealth uh, that is during the entire time they were in the study. Uh, this could be uh, over 20 years. Uh, but before their death, uh, that there is a negative factor, and it stays negative, gets a little bit uh, stronger as we add in other variables. There's a negative factor for the highest reported wealth. Once again, if we only put this factor in, this would be a positive factor. We want people to be wealthy, right? But at this point, we already know how much wealth they died with, okay? Uh, since we already know how much wealth they died with, uh, we actually want to have them die with a lot of wealth, but we want to have a positive uh, trajectory where they're actually, um, uh, their wealth is increasing up to uh, the point of death, right? Uh, and so if they had a, uh, a very low reported wealth, um, uh, if their highest reported wealth was, was right here, at, at, at right before death, if that was their highest reported wealth, um, then that's fantastic. Well, that means that, uh, that, um, that this number, we want it to be as low as possible. We know it can't be any lower than this because they actually reported this in their last survey prior to death. So uh, since it can't be any lower than that, um, we actually would like all of the other reports to have been lower, meaning that we, we want them down here. Why? Because if the other reports were higher, then that means we had this kind of trajectory. And this kind of trajectory of wealth where they were very, very wealthy and then they ended with this much wealth, much lower amount of wealth, makes people less generous. Uh, even though they're both ending with the same amount of wealth, say, for example, they end with $10 million. Um, if they got to that from $100 million, those people are going to be less generous uh, than somebody who got to that at $1 million. Uh, so that's why this is a negative factor here. Um, the... Uh, uh, the effect of the average reported wealth and the effect of the lowest reported wealth uh, gives us a little bit, uh, sort of some nuance to this. Now, the lowest reported wealth, uh, this is also negative. 
uh, that suggests that we want um, we want this number to be low, right? We want because if this number is low, the lowest that the wealth ever was, uh, then we get a more positive trajectory. Um, the average reported wealth being high uh, that that might suggest that. Uh, um, maybe if we have kind of a curved relationship like this, uh, that, that maybe that's, uh, that's a bit better than this kind of a curve. Um, I'm, so so uh, a little nuances here in the average reported wealth, but actually the thing to keep in mind is just simply uh, do we have a positive trajectory or negative trajectory? That, that's, that's in general what these results are, uh, are showing us. Uh, a similar idea here, we've got the highest – year of giving and the highest year of giving is negative now again if this was the only variable in the model this would be very positive but because we're looking at a nine variable model that in particular tells us what our average giving was um, we actually uh, like this not, not only the uh, average giving but the uh, giving in the last report uh, so uh, we actually want that highest uh, to be um, uh, uh, to be lower, not higher. So what does that mean? Well, that means we know what their giving was, let's say, here, right before, and let's say this is the point of death, okay? And we know uh, what, their, uh, what their average giving was over, uh, over time. Now, if we already know their average, um, let's, say, let's say the average uh, was the, the same uh, as the uh, ending uh, giving, okay? If they had a super high year of giving up here, okay, all right, what that means is these were people whose giving may have been, uh, maybe it was nothing, 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 and then they made one big gift, and then it was nothing, 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 and then we know how much they gave at the end. Now compare that to somebody whose biggest gift was just this, okay? Would you rather have somebody who every single year, um, and, uh, let me switch to the little rectangle boxes, every single year gave consistently, let's say a million dollars a year, uh, which uh, means their highest uh, uh, year of giving actually uh, actually comes down, um, or somebody who just made one gift of say, you know, ten million dollars, right? Which would you rather have? And the answer is you'd actually rather have this person that consistently gave a million dollars a year, not this person that gave one gift of ten million dollars, uh, and then that was it. Even though both of those people. Uh, would have a uh, average of one million dollars a year. Uh, you prefer the person who gave a million dollars a year every year for ten years than somebody who only gave one ten million dollar gift and never donated before or after that. That's why this is actually a negative factor. It has to do with the shape of the uh, giving that's taking place. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have the effect of being married. Uh, if you are married, then about $2,400 less on average uh, is going to go to um, is going to go to chair. Okay, now let's look at a few other uh, demographics that come into play here. Uh, this is looking just at decedents' estates, uh, and we're combining everybody who's been in the HRS uh, who has uh, who has died. Uh, and, uh, and we're dividing them by marital status and by gender, okay? So we've got uh, married females, married males, unmarried females, unmarried males, okay? So this first one just says the total number of decedents uh, who, are, uh, who are in this. Uh, and uh, the, our total number of decedents, uh, you notice that we've got um, quite a few unmarried uh, females. That's the biggest block. Uh, two reasons for that. Uh, one is that uh, if you uh, th that this is this is an older age group uh, that we're looking at. Older age groups tend to be more female, uh, and so you're going to have uh, more uh, females in this group of decedents than males. That that's again um, has a little bit to do with how this survey was put together. 
that back in uh, back in uh, uh, ninety three. Uh, the survey, um, one of the survey predecessors started with only people who were age 70 and above. So it started with a, uh, a fairly uh, old uh, age group uh, that came into the study. Uh, that was called the, uh, well, it's just called the AHEAD. I'm going to clear that because I can't actually, um, uh, can't actually type very well or, or write very well when I'm trying to write with the mouse. Uh, but the idea is that uh, older age groups, um, th- that this survey has not always been uh, representative of the 50 and above population. Uh, some of the predecessor surveys before 1998, when it became representative of the 50 and above population, uh, represented much older population. So uh, that's why this is, uh, uh, this is not precisely uh, accurate because of the, those uh, earlier uh, groups. And so, uh, so consequently, we have a, a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, women. And in particular, you notice that we have a lot of unmarried women uh, and relatively few married women. And again, the reason is uh, that women uh, tend to outlive men, uh, and uh, on average, men tend to marry uh, younger uh, women, uh, and women tend to marry older men. Um, and, uh, and so you get this, uh, uh, this result where uh, typically uh, you've got a lot of unmarried females, relatively few uh, married uh, females. Uh, you get the uh, opposite of that uh, when it comes to the men, uh, where you get more married men are dying uh, fewer unmarried men are dying. Um, probably not because their wives are actually killing them. Uh, it's just because uh, the men are dying first uh, and uh, they are a bit older um, on average uh, than their uh, than their spouses. Okay, uh, so that's the number of decedents that we get. Uh, then we look at the total estate dollars. So, in other words, who controlled the money? Uh, so, uh, notice one of the things that we have happening here uh, is that we've got this group of married men uh, that are actually controlling quite a bit of money compared to the number of people. In, uh, in complete reverse of that, we have this group of unmarried women very large group, in fact, the largest of the four groups in terms of total number, but they control relatively little wealth. Okay, so there's a big difference there. A big difference there. Uh, some other uh, things uh, that are that are taking place. Uh, if we look at unmarried males, that they control about the amount of wealth you would expect them to control. Uh, married females control a bit more wealth uh, than uh, uh, than the average. Uh, but the ones that actually control much less wealth are the unmarried females. Now we look at the total number of charitable bequests. So this is any transfer uh, to a um, to a charity uh, that actually dollars go to a charity at death. Now I use this term bequests here in the general vernacular uh, sense. Uh, in other words, I'm not talking about uh, that it has to go through a will document, that it's actually a transfer of personal property. I'm talking about any uh, type of transfers uh, in the estate uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the charity. Uh, so uh, this is um, uh, when we look at the number of charitable bequests, let's look at unmarried males, um, about the same. So the number of total unmarried males uh, is reflected in exactly that number uh, or approximately that number of charitable bequests. We look at unmarried females, uh, and even though they are the largest group here, they are yet more uh, rep- larger uh, when it comes to the total number of charitable bequests. Now, here's the trade off they're the biggest group, they're an even bigger share of total uh, charitable bequests by number. But they don't control much wealth, right? So you've got, there's a lot of them. Uh, They're very likely, uh, unmarried females, very likely to leave a bequest, but they don't control that much wealth. And so that's why when we get over here to the actual charitable bequest dollars transferred, um, these dollars are much smaller uh, than the uh, than the um, than the number of bequests. Uh, so the number of bequests. This is a larger 
share, but the amount of bequest dollars is a, a smaller share. Uh, and in fact, uh, the the amount of bequest dollars is a little bit, um, you know, it's a, it's a little bit closer to um, slightly less than the population uh, representation. Uh, so even though they're more charitable, they control less wealth, and so they represent um, actually slightly less of the total dollars of charitable bequest than uh, their population share. Uh, so more charitable, but less dollars uh, for for that group. Okay, so let's look at uh, now the uh, married men. Uh, remember the uh, married men, uh, they uh, represent the largest share of men, uh, and they control a lot of wealth, but they don't, um, they don't make charitable bequests very often. Uh, and, uh, and when they make those charitable bequests, even though they control a lot of wealth, uh, they're not giving very much. So here you've got married men controlling the largest segment of estate wealth, wealth that's going through their estate, but just very, relatively speaking to the amount of wealth that they're controlling, right? relatively speaking, not many dollars are going to a charity uh, for the married men. Uh, now, if we look at uh, uh, the married females, uh, married females, they are um, about as likely to leave a charitable bequest as their share of the population. Now, this contrasts with married men. Married men are much less likely to, to uh, leave uh, that money to charity at death. Um, uh, and the uh, amount that they leave is not reflective of their much higher wealth holdings. Uh, married uh, women actually don't leave that much money. Uh, to charity at, at death as compared to the uh, number of bequests that they're leaving. Uh, so, uh, you know, they're more likely to leave a bequest uh, as compared to, to uh, married men. Notice these are about the same. Their uh, share of the total number of decedents, share of the total number of charitable bequests, about the same. Uh, this differs from uh, married men uh, where the uh, share uh, they're a larger share of the total number of decedents and a smaller share of the total number of, uh, of bequests. Um, so the uh, married women are more generous in terms of likelihood of including a gift, uh, but they don't leave much money, um, e even, as, uh, you know, even as compared to, to the wealth that they're controlling. <clears throat> now, here's the interesting group, and, and this is probably from a practical fundraising perspective. This is probably what I would uh, say is one of the most interesting uh, pieces from a uh, targeting perspective, and that is the unmarried males. Now, look, married males, uh, they yeah, they control a lot of wealth, but they're very unlikely to leave a bequest, and they don't leave uh, dollars reflective of the wealth they're controlling. But unmarried males, they... Uh, they control uh, about as much uh, wealth as, uh, as represents their share of the population. They make about as many charitable bequests as the typical share of the population, but they're actually transferring a lot more dollars. So contrast this with the unmarried females. Unmarried females, bigger share of the population, but they control less wealth. Bigger share of the total uh, bequests, but because they control much less wealth, their uh, actual share of total bequest dollars is, uh, is just really at or maybe slightly below their share of the population. So this is all to say, even though we've seen previously that men are less likely to leave a gift uh, to a charity than women, don't ignore the single men. And again, we're looking at an older audience here, so, so think of uh, you know, 60s, 70s, 80s. Don't ignore the single men because they actually represent a larger share of the total bequest dollars than their share of the population. Now look, married men, um, relatively unlikely to leave a gift, and, and these aren't massive gifts. Um, you know, married women... Uh, more likely to uh, leave a gift, but they're not really big gifts uh, compared to their wealth size. But notice these unmarried um, men, uh, the amount of dollars they're leaving compared to their wealth size is a lot. 
So uh, even though we, we tend to pick on men because they're less likely to leave a gift, this is due mostly to the married men over here, um, uh, n- don't ignore the, the, uh, the single uh, men because of, uh, you know, look, it's nice to work with the, uh, the uh, unmarried females uh, because they really like to leave these gifts, but they don't control that much wealth. Uh, whereas the uh, uh, unmarried men, um, they uh, are, you know, normal amount likely to, uh, uh, to uh, leave the charitable bequest, but we don't get this drop uh, here in the uh, – they actually control the amount of wealth you would expect on average for them to control. So again, uh, don't ignore uh, the, uh, the um, un- unmarried, uh, unmarried men. Okay, so that was dealing with the fourth question. Who is likely to make a large charitable estate gift at the end of life?